Here's how and why WebCon BPS scales and performs to enterprise standards. This is all about enterprise readiness. And look, WebCon BPS is particularly good at enterprise readiness. Let me give you some examples. Here's one. More than 32,000 instances of 89 processes serving 28,000 users across 30 different business entities. That's something we do every day. Another WebCon customer. Over 187,000 instances of over 100 processes using more than 15 terabytes of data. It's common. It's easy. It's real. Another example. More than 380,000 instances of 140 different processes serving 25,000 users across 1,700 locations. It's not that we can't be big. Because it's not about size. I mean, it is, but we can handle size, but size is not what makes something enterprise. It's about seriousness. It's about complexity. And that stuff matters. And to get at what we mean by complexity and seriousness, I, I, I need to start by asking you a question. What's in an application? Or what do you think is in an application? If you're thinking it's you know a combination of these things, data and reports and workflow and connections and forms, look, that's fine. It, an application does begin here, but sorry, that's not enough. There's more going on in an application than that. Even if we look at the way we often uh, diagram out the way WebCom BPS works, where we have a central core engine that... Uh, has a complete design environment for different application elements and then a uh, framework for connecting to a lot of content and facilities living in other places and also bringing in an end user interface that provides a consistent experience in a lot of different places. Doesn't matter. Even this, as much as I like it, this is still not enough. This doesn't tell you what belongs in a solution. An application graduating to a solution, well, here. This is the kind of stuff you need to think about if you really want to graduate from just an application that was built in one place for one time and a solution. It's all of these things. They all matter. Testing matters. Documenting matters. Adoption matters. Being able to explain it matters. Being able to deploy it and manage change matters in a big way big, big way. Now, if your platform doesn't handle these things, guess what? You're handling these things manually. And typically, just building the application is the beginning of a solution. To actually deliver a solution <clears throat> and curate that solution, you need more. And that's what we're here to talk about today. So what can WebCon BPS handle in the platform out of the box to graduate from just an application into a full-blown solution? Let's begin with a robust architecture. This is a state machine concept that we are based around at WebCon. We, there are a lot of different products out there that talk about uh, things that behave like state machines, but WebCon actually built state machine style thinking and behavior under the hood or under the bonnet, if you would. Here's where I'm going with this. If you're not sure of what a state machine is, you need to think about it like this. It's not just being able to jump sideways and backwards and all that kind of stuff. It, it really comes down to this. Let's use a lamp, a table lamp or a desk lamp as an example. So uh, my lamp is off at the moment. And I pull a chain on the lamp. And that causes a circuit to be completed. And now the lamp is on. Congratulations, we've just moved from one state to another. The event that caused it was the pulling of a chain and the during the transformation or the transition we performed the action of completing the circuit. 
Now I can trigger an event again, pulling the chain, and that'll cause another transition to take place during which we'll break the circuit and now we're in the off state. The key terms here, you can see them in colors. The stuff that's in red, like off, those are states. The stuff in black, those are events. The stuff in blue, those are transition activities. We in Webcon BPS, look, we, we live by this. This is how we work. But that having been said, it's friendlier to call states, steps, and transitions, paths. It just is. A lot of user testing confirmed that people like these terms better. So we call them steps, events, and paths. Now, things to keep in mind. In a state machine, nothing is waiting. I don't have a bunch of process instances waiting to, uh, you know, what do I do next? What do I do next? What do I do next? There's not some queue of stuff that's spinning around in cycles waiting for an event to take place. No, in a state machine universe, everything is always at rest until an event causes a transition, and then it goes back to being at rest in a new state. That's how state machines work. It has a huge impact on scalability. In fact, if we talk about this at scale, let's look at it this way. If I am using traditional queue-based processing, I have a lot of instances lined up waiting to do the next thing on their list. In a state machine world, a workflow instance is just a row of data in a database. It is sitting at rest until an event gets triggered that it's registered to react to. And then the engine goes ahead and does what's necessary to move it from one filing cabinet to a different filing cabinet. That's how workflows work in a state machine world, and it scales massively because it's just about managing data instead of managing queues. Here's what it looks like in a data life cycle. You see, I, I happen to have uh, something here that is approved, and I'm going to move it from approved to canceled. Approved is where you would normally end something. But in our world, finished is just another step. And it doesn't even have to be final. Yes, we're now in the finished state. And that data will stay there forever. And if I decide, oh, even though it is finished, I actually now want to cancel this approved leave. I will move it from one finished state to a different finished state. That's perfectly OK and perfectly legal. If you were using somebody else, I'd have to start up a whole new workflow to cancel it. And the process would be divorced from the data. That's about as cerebral as I want to get in terms of low level architecture and the conceptual modeling it's based on. But these kinds of design decisions ripple through to a bunch of other practical, uh, tangible things including this, synchronous processing. So we can have all of these things you're seeing here take place during a transition from one step to another. And by doing that, I can assure you that all of those six things are going to take place together or not. All activity during an event is transacted. It either completes or it rolls back. If you want synchronous processing during a transition, you get it and you don't have to do anything extra for it. On the other hand, if you'd prefer to do everything asynchronously, it is absolutely okay to have one workflow call out to another workflow to get things done. In fact, it can call out to several workflows to get something done. So we will launch several sub workflows here at this point. And then in this step, we will be at rest waiting for those sub workflows to continue. And depending on whether they finish negatively or positively, or whether there were no workflows to wait for, we will branch appropriately to whatever the next step needs to be. Sub workflows are spawned and monitored in each sub workflow. The reason we like this so much compared to parallel branching is that every sub workflow has assignees. Every sub workflow has a state, and it's completely easy to track all of that. If you just do parallel branching, 
Well, monitoring that workflow and adjusting it and, and everything else, it really has multiple states and multiple statuses and multiple assignees at any given time, and it's really hard to track. This is honest about the way parallel processing works. It's asynchronous sub-workflows, and it scales massively. And again, it's also much easier to govern. Deployment and maintainability would be another big deal about the way WebCon BPS works. Check this out. When we are packaging a solution, it's a lot more than workflows, forms, reports, and connectors. And the best efforts I've seen from a couple of other platforms put these together after the fact. Yeah, you build them independently, but you come up with a way to snap them together and then deploy them as a set. But you know what I say to these things? What about the data? Isn't data part of your application? Uh, I've seen countless scenarios where someone modeled data proactively, say on SharePoint lists or in SQL Server databases or Oracle databases or what have you, uh, and, and they created one schema that exists in the dev environment. And then when you go to deploy to a test environment, things are slightly different, and the application breaks upon delivery. Here's what packaging looks like for us. It's pretty straightforward. I'm just going to uh, go through uh, one particular application. There are two different processes here. One process has multiple workflows, and then it's got a data schema, and then it has some extra assets like constants and business rules and form rules and uh, reports and dashboards and all kinds of things that are user interface wise. And while we're talking about the user interface, Let's go back and look at the form layout, because that's part of the application as well, and the form behavior. A lot of that is configured based on a model. And when I go to package this and deploy it, I can deploy the entire thing with one button. That includes external dependencies and settings and so on. Why is this so powerful? I don't think of packaging as a separate step. The application, as I'm building it, is a package. And let's talk about staging, because one of the things we did was to come up with separate settings for dev versus test versus production in terms of any external data requirements or external APIs we need to call. Look, we know full well you probably don't want to use the same database or the same tables as you move from a dev environment to a test environment to a production environment. So let's have that application model recognize the different locations, and then when you go to deploy, you indicate where it's running and we'll just use the right settings. So you can pre-configure the per stage details. Here's what it looks like when you actually attempt to import and deploy something. We're going to grab that import package, and we will go ahead here and take all the defaults. You can customize it, but that's not so important right now. Here we're importing an exported application package, and it is finished. Yep, there we go. We got a report on what changed and what didn't. Basically, a new application got added. It referenced a few global resources that did not need to change. And let's go take a look at it. And let's open one particular process, uh, maybe one workflow. There it is. All right, it is exactly what it is supposed to be. That is the application that got exported. But if we look at the process, a couple of things have been done here. You'll notice that red exclamation point. That's because this process was modified by an export import mechanism and we've deployed it to production. We by default put a governor on this so that you don't accidentally make changes to it. You should, I mean, you can, if you uncheck this checkbox, we'll give you the freedom to do so, but we will hassle you until you uncheck that, uh, that if you try to make changes, we'll warn you that you're affecting something in production. And what you really should be doing is going back to the dev version, changing that and redeploying it. You have the option, but we're trying to enforce best practices, or at least encourage them. So all dependencies have been brought together here, and there's no post-deployment cleanup to be said. This is ready to use. No, no, no final tweaking or anything like that. And that enables 
instant change to take place as we move from uh, deployment to deployment. If I update this, I just need to make the change in question. And then even running instances see that change. We've made a change to the application model and the entire application updates immediately. If this is a uh, staged deployment scenario, that's fine. The instant changes take place upon deployment, not upon saving. So you can have your cake and eat it too, to use metaphors. You can have uh, truly instant changing in your dev environment and then truly instant changes upon deployment in your production environment. That's instant change. Instant change also manifests in a couple of other ways. Here I am making a modification to data schema. Uh, I'm changing the name of a field and its data type. But once I have done that, uh, I then go to the form and I see that the update has taken place here. The change wasn't isolated. In fact, it's happening in the report. Everywhere that refers to that field now knows that the field's name and data type was changed and we just instantly adapted. Instant change is because everything is completely connected. It's an integrated solution rather than a composite solution. And another artifact of instant change is this. If I want to change something, I will see what will be affected. Dependencies are known. It's really, really easy for me to see for a field, for a rule, for a data source, for anything where it's being used. So if I want to change something that might affect other things and I'd like to know what it could affect, this is just in the box. It's also understandable and explainable. Yes, this is actually an important thing for, for enterprise solutions, as opposed to just standalone, one-off, itch-scratching applications. We have friendly but functional models. This model looks pretty basic. It's got one, two, three, four, five squares in it, right? These represent steps. They don't represent every action taking place. I mean, you do see paths between the steps and so on, but there's actually a lot going on behind the scenes. This friendly yet functional model, you see these little gear icons? Those gear icons indicate that there's activity happening during that transition. So this model is actually pretty detailed and pretty elaborate. It's a high level view, but a lot of drill down detail. What this saves you is the trouble of doing things you ought to be doing, like documenting your process in great detail. It's too difficult to do that if it's a double effort, once to actually do the application and a second time to create a simpler, higher level diagram uh, that stakeholders can understand without getting bogged down in the details. We allow you to model it once and have it, the model be as general or as specific as you need. The other thing about it is, because the application is based on a model, we are able to generate documentation out of the application meta, um, metadata on the fly. Here, let's go take a look at documentation that we just generated for this particular application. We generated a Word document. Yeah, we have document generation built in, Word documents, PowerPoint documents, PDFs, other things. But this is full product and solution documentation from start to finish. The application's a model, so we just use the model metadata and produce documentation as needed. In fact, if you want to see how an application changed, compare a new version of this document with an old version and just do a Word document comparison. It's an easy way to have the differences be highlighted in a very friendly, human-readable way. There are ways to inspect all changes in great detail, but it starts to be something uh, more for the designer and less for the stakeholder. This is a way to deal with stakeholder re uh, desires to see what changed in applications. So documentation is a good thing. It should not be thought of as a luxury. And the metadata that you use in order to make it usable for uh, documentation, that's also used to help document the model. 
So these descriptions that you see here that are showing up as tool tips inside of the design environment, well, we get to use that over and over again. They were showing up in the Word document that you saw before, but they're also showing up here on the form as tool tips and task details and such. We're going to help users use applications without having to do extra work. And yes, this is the difference between a one-off application and an enterprise solution. You generate help from model metadata. And user interfaces. Let's talk about consistency amongst interfaces, because I do think this counts. As we move from one form to another, and the forms are coming from different applications, look, they're different. They're very different from each other because they're different applications, but they're consistent. If I know how to use one, I know how to use another. And here are various dashboards and reports. But again, if I learn one application, I've learned them all. Here's a risk management solution made up out of one, two, three, four, five different parts. Well, here are the same five different parts being displayed as web parts in a SharePoint page or as tabs inside of Teams, or for that matter, uh, if a lot of people work in Outlook, fine, here, we're in Outlook and we're seeing the details about a particular risk management task showing up in an add-in. One way or another, if you learn one application, you will understand them all. It's also scalable and reliable. Time to talk a little bit more about architecture and a little bit less about um, screen captures, but that's okay. Uh, this is a this is even the most complicated deployment of WebCom BPS inside of an environment. It's a moderately elaborate thing. Make no mistake, the whole thing could just be on one server if you want, but this has dedicated servers scaled out to provide front end capabilities. So far, so good. They need to store data someplace. So some databases are directly supporting operations for processes. Other databases are dedicated to handling archival data to keep uh, the performance of the uh, currently in use processes lean and mean. Some databases might be dedicated just for storing attachments. Uh, those are options. You can keep everything in a single database if you want. And you can have dedicated servers or sets of servers to handle things like search indexing and search index processing or OCR, excuse me, OCRing documents and scanning them and such. Uh, there are dedicated server functions that can be used in lots of places depending on preferences. And again, it can get more elaborate than this or the whole thing can run on a single box. Just depends on your requirements. The architecture accommodates it. Here's another thing we do in, order, in our architecture in order to accommodate a lot of elaborate work. Uh, external services matter quite a lot. Uh, an external service might be serving up uh, directory information, or it might be serving up, uh, oh, I don't know, currency conversions or uh, um, sentiment analysis or any of a number of different things. But certainly currencies and uh, directory entries are, are very, very uh, frequently used externalities, and that's fine, except that in a lot of solution platforms or application platforms at least, when an, a workflow runs multiple times, each time it executes, it's calling out to an external service. That involves network traffic, that involves, uh, could involve money, uh, depending on whether micropayments are involved. Uh, and it also involves making sure high availability is there. Well, what we offer you, we, we can do it like this in, in WebCon land, but what we offer for frequently used data is the ability to grab it once on a schedule and update it from time to time, stage it in a database, and as your workflow executes multiple times, we'll just query the database. We do that for user lists, for group dependencies, we do that for uh, uh, international currency conversions and such. We actually do it for several things. Uh, sometimes you do need to go directly to the data to the external service in real time, but a lot of the time when the data doesn't change constantly, caching 
helps a great deal, not just in terms of performance, but in also uh, in the sense of staging data from several places into one table that can be queried uh, in a very robust and productive way. This scales better is probably a, a quick and easy way to, to, to explain what I'm talking about. Search, by the way, I mentioned search. How about being able to use the search index since we're collecting uh, uh, index data on properties and full text anyway? Let's, let's run this report based on a database lookup. And, and that worked pretty well. But we can improve on this, at least in terms of query performance, by switching to using the search index. It's almost up to date. It's usually a few seconds out of date, but only a few seconds. And the results are much faster. And they also, uh, by, by relegating a lot of uh, query performance to the search index, you allow uh, database activity to happen more quickly for updates and inserts and deletes. You don't have to do this, but we provide it as an option. If we index it in text and properties anyway, why not use that over and over again? Not a requirement, and until your application gets to be of a certain size, this is probably not something you'll care about. But all you need to do is change one thing in a dropdown, and it just works. Let's also talk about governance. Monitoring and metrics matter. And here we are, we're monitoring uh, the profiling of different services going on and which workflow users have been brought in from Active Directory or Azure AD or what have you. Here are timeouts that we're keeping track of from different places. Here are uh, reports on task delegations and analyses and so on, like who has received which tasks from which processes and how are they doing. How about attachments? Uh, have we had any issues with file I.O. and document I.O. and document activity? It looks like in some cases we had temporary issues that then resolved themselves. Okay, that's good. How about processing time? That's not a particularly hard thing to monitor and, and to raise alerts if something is anomalous. Um, how about running modules? Here's everything running in terms of separate subservices in Webcom BPS. And it looks like in some cases for monitoring uh, exchange mailboxes, we're doing well in some places, but not in others. We need to fix that. How about um, activity for different services? That's not a particularly difficult thing for us to do in terms of downloading exchange rates, updating OLAP cubes, uh, processing uh, task substitutions and such. It's pretty easy, and it's all something that happens without any surprises. That's monitoring and metrics. You get errors, you get activities, you get workloads. It's all there in the box. How about timeout operations? Timeouts is one of the reports you saw on an aggregate basis, but inside of every form, if you've got expected timeout values, you can see whether or not uh, the execution of a task at different points in its progression have been happening in a timely way. Everyone gets this information. So metadata is not just for IT. Metadata is for the people that actually use the application. And in a process that involves st strict deadlines, you not having to write this logic into your application means you deliver it faster, you can change it faster, because checking to see whether something got done on time is just part of our plumbing. It's a very good thing. Uh, on that matter for action profiling, so this is the history of what happened as something executed, and we can see at different points different things happened. Uh, but I might want more detail than that. So if I go into admin mode, I see more steps. And when I open up the steps, I see how much time they took. And if it involved calling a web service or retrieving data from a SQL query or something like that, we'll actually show you the details of the interaction with an externality. But you get a lot more detail, and all you need are the right privileges in order to receive that kind of information. So history and administration mode is great for debugging purposes or profiling purposes and other purposes too. User acceptance testing. That is something that is directly available here. What you're looking at is a workflow diagram, but I have uh, embedded information on how often we pass from one 
step to another so I can see whether or not there are cases, like for example, as we move from board approval to requisition rejected, this doesn't seem to happen. So I either incorrectly assume that the board might reject requisitions or uh, users are just clever enough to not submit anything that would be rejected or I've made rejection too difficult to do and boards don't realize that they need to do it. But if I want to see how people are using my application and how things are playing out, getting a big picture of how users have used my application is one click away. All I did was click here on audit. It's not limited to path step usage, but it does start there. Here's another thing, profiling reports. What I'm looking at here is if I have indicated how much time I expect people to spend in this step, I can see how much time they're actually spending in that step and other steps and so on and so forth. It allows me to compare the actual to the forecast. So not just what choices are users making, how long is it taking to make them? And I get that information within my design environment by just clicking this button. That testing and that debugging, if I add debug equals one to any URL, I suddenly get the ability to profile the form, including all the actions that were taken to load the form and operate on the contents of the form. So if I want to know how well my application is behaving, whether it's doing something or not, and how well it's doing what we asked it to do, this is something that is at your fingertips. So it's not just about process back-end workflow performance, it's about front-end form performance too. This stuff is in the box. You don't have to trot out extra facilities to do these kinds of tests. And in terms of scheduling operations, list synchronization, substitutions, KPI calculations, currency rate downloads, determining which hours are offline or nighttime hours versus uh, daytime uh, service hours, what some people would call hours of operation or training hours. You can determine all of this and we will adapt accordingly. So you can manage automation with automation. We practice what we preach. Delegating tasks, this is another big deal about governance. If I decide that I shouldn't be doing this, I should have, in this particular case, this guy named Bill cover it for me, I just need to indicate that I'm delegating it to Bill. And then you see, instead of it being assigned to Rhoda, Bill is taking care of it as a substitute. And if I go over here to Bill's environment and I refresh, I see now that I've got that task that had previously been assigned to Rhoda assigned to me as a substitute. So I know who was initially given it, and I know that I'm filling in for Rhoda, and so I will just go ahead and complete this task. And now we both have a stake in it. If it reverts to Rhoda, I can either be pulled out of this whole mix or I can be uh, kept in the loop. It just depends. But task delegation is a really easy thing to do on an ad hoc basis without you having to write that logic into your application. That part's really, really important. I could handle substitutions within my own workflow, but then my workflow starts to get crazy in terms of permutations and paths. That's just not necessary if the system understands how to do this in the infrastructure. We also extrapolate that to bulk operations. So let's say I'm going to be gone for a while and I want someone to take over all of my actions, all of my tasks, all of my uh, running process instances from a particular start date to a particular completion date. This is a very, very easy thing for me to take care of. Uh, I set it up here and it is registered and it's going to happen when the time comes. It's easy to handle in bulk as it is per process. What's more from an administrative point of view, it's a painless thing for me to go ahead and do that on behalf of someone else. So in this particular case, I will take all of Alice's 
uh, tasks, and I will substitute in Horace to cover for her while she is gone between these dates. And that I'm going to do not for everything. I'm just going to have Horace cover for Alice for this particular application and this particular process. We may be doing other things with other people to act as substitutes for other processes later. Essentially, on an administrative basis, this is not a difficult thing to do. And we're not done when it comes to substitutions, because this is a big thing. It happens all the time. Here we have a, uh, a leave approval process, and I've built into it whom I want to have substitute for me, both in general and for certain specific processes. So in general, uh, uh, this person wants Luke to cover for them, but for one particular process, the client intake process, we're going to have Bill cover for them. And then they submit it, and the adjustments take place automatically. That's all there is to it. Where it happens, there's that workflow diagram, and here you see create substitution as an action within the workflow process. That's all it takes. We create a substitution based on those user preferences. So we can handle it manually on a per person, per process basis. We can handle it in a scheduled fashion for everything for a user. We can handle it from an administrative console, and we can handle it within a workflow. It's easy to do this as part of a process. Multi-language issues. We've done a whole webinar on this in the past, but yeah, you can see the same application in English and French and Russian and Polish and German. Actually, we have lots and lots of language packs. Uh, we are able to localize the overall environment. So the user interface as a whole. We can also localize the application, so name of application, descriptive information, field names and such, and we can even localize the content. So here, uh, this is a choice from a drop-down list of different leave types, and we're seeing it in French because the drop-down list of choices has different columns for English names and French names and German names and so on and so forth. So you get localization of everything. Let's talk about archiving. In this particular case, when a workflow instance gets to canceled, mm -hmm. I would like this to not clutter up reports, queues, history lists, and so on. I, I don't want to lose it, but I want to set it off to the side in an archive of this application. So I'm going to build into the workflow process logic that we're going to take this instance and archive it from one database to another when certain things happen. And I'm even going to give uh, the operator the option to do this anytime they want by making it a global action. So if it's halfway done and they want to move it to the archive database, they could do that too. I actually don't love this option, but some people desperately want it, and it's not a painful thing for us to do. In fact, it's even possible for us to have this work on a timer basis. So if I wanted, for example, uh, to have this execute after a period of time, so let's say we have the workflow get to the canceled state, I want it to stay in the production database or the active database for 30 days. So I might create a new timeout that lasts for 30 days. And after that 30 uh, day period, once we hit that event, then we can go in and move it from uh, uh, the production database to the archive database. Or we can do other things too. You're seeing the removal of personal data. Well, all, these kinds of things are part of a process with manual options. But when we talk about personal data, we have privacy protections built into the plumbing of our solution. You don't have to write code or non-code assets to handle with GPPR requirements or other privacy restrictions. If, if you have flagged a field as containing personal identifiable data, 
you can indicate what should be done with it. And that can happen on a scheduled basis or a monolithic basis. But yeah, if you say something's a personal data dictionary, after a certain period of time, maybe we anonymize it. Maybe we uh, delete it. Maybe we do nothing. It just depends on the circumstances. But you get to control this, and you don't have to do extra work to make it happen. GDPR is in our DNA. And then finally, we can use artificial intelligence for identifying anomalies. This is something that doesn't really start to be a value until you have at least a thousand instances of a running process. But once we get to a certain point, we start looking at the patterns of uh, uh, a constantly executing process and then start to make inferences. And then we monitor activity to see where it deviates from established patterns. And then we can alert you to anomalous entries and point out that you might want to take a look at those things. In conclusion, when you add a robust architecture to deployment and maintainability and understandability and scalability and reliability and governability, that adds up to a better way to workflow. Something we like to call the WebCon way. Thank you very much for watching this. If you'd like to know more about WebCon, just to peruse articles, learn more about product, or schedule a demo, visit us at www.webcon.com.